Greetings. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, the 10th of December of 2023. This service was pre-recorded on Friday the 8th. Participants include the Lawrence County Brass Band, Chris Macy, Jesse Croach, Kevin Roraval, and Tom Schaffner. Reader and video photographer Shane Donnelly and myself. And the Acolytes have returned the Mars family, Olivia, Elena, Alexa, and Dylan. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Boys and girls, I have been sharing with you this Christmas season my upbringing as a boy and what my family did at Christmas time. Now, the Gilbert family are candy eaters, a lot of candy, especially at Christmas time. And I have some candies I'm going to share with you. It is very possible you don't even know they exist candies that were very popular long ago but not so popular today but still available and they make their appearance at christmas time and a candy that i'm going to share with you we used to call these mothballs and they're candy filberts this is what a vision of sugar plums the sugar plum fairy that's what that's about it is a nut covered with sugar and boy are they good and they make their appearance at Christmas time another thing that you may have seen is ribbon candy and look at this hard candy it looks like ribbon you can even hang it on the Christmas tree here are candy peanuts it's a hard candy shaped like a peanut filled with peanut butter and candy straws. They kind of look like a candy cane, but not. They're filled with a white creamy substance. And raspberries. It's a hard candy, but inside it's kind of like jelly. All sorts <clears throat> is a licorice candy. Yeah. And another candy I'm going to share with you. It's called Turkish Delight, and it has been around for hundreds of years. It has its own flavor, which I like very much. And another candy I'm going to share with you is sort of a, a pricey candy. They're called French Creams. Now, when I was a boy, I saved my money, and I would go Christmas shopping and I would buy presents for my grandparents. And remember, I'm a little boy and I don't have a lot of money. And when I was a boy visiting my grandfathers, my brothers and I would be instructed that before we walk out the door, that we were to kiss our grandmother and grandfather goodbye. And I really didn't like kissing my grandfathers because 
they chewed tobacco. And it had a, to a smell that I did not like when I went near to kiss them. All right, so, but when I was a boy, my mother said, well, why, why don't you buy them mail pouch tobacco? So the only tobacco I have ever bought in my life, when I would give my mother the money because I wouldn't be allowed to buy it as a boy, and I would give my grandfather's mail pouch tobacco. Well, I didn't like doing that. So my mother said that my grandfather and my grandmother, and they all love French creams. Now, a candy company called Brock's used to make at Christmas and Easter this sugar candy in different shapes. And they would be in a little box, really good. They would get hard quickly, so you had to eat, eat them up right away. But that's what I would buy my grandfather, and they really liked them. And so this is a remembrance of what I gave my grandfather, and that's what I'm gonna give you. But I'm not done with this message. What, what's the lesson here? Well, when we buy a person a present, we can buy them what they want, or we can buy what it is that we want for them. And maybe there's things that we enjoy and we like, but it doesn't mean anything to them. All right, so we need to think, what can I give this person that they're going to be happy to receive and just not put on the shelf and forget about it? All right, so let's think about the first Christmas. Why, why do we give all these presents at Christmas time? Because God gave us the gift of his son Jesus, the baby in the manger, but also we have from the Gospel of Luke, or the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 11. The wise men came, and they brought the baby Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I have gold, frankincense, and myrrh to share with you. This is actual gold dust in water like a snow globe. All right, so that gold has always been very valuable. Now, frankincense is sap from a tree, and it's dried and cut up, and people burn it on a charcoal briquette, and it creates a fragrant smoke. And myrrh, it had many uses too. People would use it for fragrance. They would also use it and smear it on the body like an ointment. So it had uses. Now, why in the world would the wise men give a little baby gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Why didn't they buy him a toy? Or give Jesus uh, disposable diapers? Or uh, some clothes? Isn't that what a baby would want? Why did the wise men give gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, here's an explanation. There was a wicked king by the name of Herod. And when he heard that Jesus was born, he went after him and wanted to hurt Jesus. So Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, for their safety, they fled the land and they moved to Egypt. And they stayed there for about four years. They didn't have a lot of money. What were they going to do in a foreign country? Well, the wise men were being used by God because the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh were very pricey, very costly gifts. And Joseph could have sold them at a bazaar to come up with the money to look after themselves. So there, there was a, a purpose in this gift, and it was a very needful and a very practical gift. So we remember the gift of the wise men, and I remember the gift of my grandfathers giving them French creams. And maybe what you could do this Christmas when I give you your French creams, maybe you can share them with someone who's never had one before. And you go out and do your shopping and think of the needs of other people. And you have a good day. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 57 through verse 80. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible, the birth of John the Baptist. 
When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to call the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through the holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert, until he appeared public in Israel. This is the Gospel of the Lord. A wannabe Catholic nun sought to join a cloistered convent, requiring that she take a vow of silence. At the end of each 12 months for her four-year training, she was permitted to speak only two words. After the first year, the sister remarked, work hard. At the end of the second year, food bad. The conclusion of the third year, room cold. And the fourth, I quit. The mother superior replied, well, I'm not surprised. You've been complaining ever since you've come here. The first words uttered by the priest Zechariah after the Lord imposed a nine month period of silence on him were not two, but four. His name is John. Variations exist with the spelling and the pronunciation of Zechariah, Zechariah, it might be rendered Zachariah or just Zachary. For decades, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth had prayed for a child. The senior citizens on Social Security and Medicare, members of AARP, and eligible for free coffee at McDonald's, received an answer to their petitions late in life. While burning incense at the altar in the Temple of Jerusalem, the high-ranking angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, informing him that the Baron Elizabeth would have a son to be named John, and that he would do the groundwork for our spiritual revival in the land, necessary for the coming of the long-awaited promised Messiah. Zechariah doubted the announcement, and because of his lack of faith, he could not talk for the entirety of his wife's pregnancy. The Gospel of Luke weaves the birth of John the Baptist into the storyline of Christ's nativity. Early tradition claims that the Virgin Mary was a niece of Elizabeth, thereby making their sons, Jesus and John, first cousins. 
The 24 verses just read from the longest chapter in the New Testament are a lesser known portion of the greatest story ever told. Sifting through the materials, by my research and reflection, I offer you a few points to ponder this season. Number one, this episode emphasizes the significance of our personal names. Contention arose among the circle of family and friends with the parents as to how their son was to be known. But in the case of John the Baptist, they were overruled by Almighty God. Question, prior to birth, do parents seek the counsel of the Lord for the naming of their baby? In Judaism, a baby is never named for a living individual. What if you had conferred upon your child the name John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, or Charles Manson? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not name their offspring for themselves. Jacob had 12 sons. None was his namesake. Moses had two boys. Neither took his name. Among Jews, the infant's name is a top secret. It is publicly disclosed for a boy at his bris, ritual circumcision. For a girl, it was revealed the Sabbath after birth in the synagogue service. The narrative relates that the relatives and neighbors at the party insisted the little guy be named Zechariah the second or Junior. Commentators suggest this nonconformity to standard Jewish practice was a local custom. The family and friends wanted the son to follow in the footsteps of dad and to be a priest. Carrying the same name encouraged the outcome. 2,000 years ago, John was a very popular name, as it is today, and its frequency was due to a previous hero, one of the Maccabee brothers of the holiday of Hanukkah. From the Hebrew, John translates, God is gracious. This far-fetched tale can be substantiated as true. A former governor of Texas, James Stephen Hogg, had a daughter, I'm a Hogg. When we pin a name on a son or daughter, they are stuck with it for life. Names are important. Are you pleased with the name your mom and dad selected for you? My father and his father had Shirley as their first name. Later, my father legally had a change to John Shirley. He wanted no son to bear a name causing discussion and ridicule. My mother won the argument, believing that the oldest son should be named for his dad. My father got to name me, and he liked Frederick. I like Frederick too. My dad had a younger brother, David Wayne Gilbert, killed in the Korean War. So my brother following me got this designation. And the caboose, Ronald Kent, was my mother's choice. Names in the USA assigned at birth are often what is currently popular. For a while, we found a lot of Brandons, Kyles, and Ians, and Nicoles, Stephanies, and Brittanies. In the year 2023, these names are less common. Other times, one has bestowed the name of a rock singer, a movie star, a professional athlete, a soap opera character, or a politician. Upon introduction, live or on the telephone, it is usual for me to inquire, how do you seek for me to address you? And I honor nicknames, titles, and degrees. For the life of me, I do not understand why hospitals and nursing homes demand the patient be called by the first name on the birth certificate. From my pastoral experience, I know individuals who refuse to answer healthcare workers because of their disinclination to use a middle or a nickname. 
the showdown became so intense, family members taped signs above the bed, instructing the doctor and nurses, if you want mom and dad to talk to you, this is the name they go by. During my 74 years, I have learned that some of you were given a name provoking shame, teasing, and even contempt. The book of Revelation tells us that our Heavenly Father has a name specially chosen by Him to be revealed to us when we go to heaven. There was strife at the circumcision of John over his name. The parents were compliant to the divine command. We pray about everything. Maybe parents should seek the advice of the Lord for the naming of their children is a lesson from this day in the life of John the Baptist. Number two, with all of our pains and problems and predicaments causing us much aggravation, would we ever consider that our troublesome circumstances may be the affliction of a discipline from Father God? I am not advancing the idea that all our trials and tribulations are punishments from the Lord, but the chance exists that they may be heaven's way of trying to get our attention. Life comes with predictability. The seven ages of man spills, drills, thrills, bills, ills, pills, and wills. Into each life, some rain must fall. That's life. Zechariah, as a religious professional, was not new on the job. He was a veteran servant of the Lord. He should have known better than to backtalk an angel. And for his resistance, Zechariah received as a penalty the inability to verbally communicate with anyone for three quarters of a year. Listen to the Word of God, Revelation 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Corrective measures implemented by God are based upon His desire to see we make a U-turn and uphold a witness and pursue righteous living. Our Father in Heaven does not intend to destroy us, nor are we disciplined permanently. The ambition is to get us on track. The silence foisted on Zechariah fostered a means for God's man to think through his past conduct. His voice was not restored the day that John was born, but eight days later, when the son was circumcised in a naming ceremony. Zechariah didn't say his name will be or should be, his name is John. Zechariah submitted to the Lord's chastisement, and with this one brief sentence indicated an obedience. If we are indulging in activities offensive to the Lord, now is the time for a breakthrough. Never underestimate the power of obedience for things to turn around for our good. When I was in high school, for the 11th and 12th grades, I took art as a major. Please be advised that part of the education of an art student, teachers and other students critique your artwork. During high school and college, I was always on the honor roll. For a while, my high school teacher, Mrs. Chandler, was giving me C's. Student work was displayed in the classroom with grades for all to see. People, what a humbling experience. And as a perfectionist, I didn't do very well with a C. Before the other students, Mrs. Chandler shared that for whatever reason unknown to her, that the quality of my projects were declining and that she ran the risk, knowing that I would be upset, the only way she could motivate me to improve was to lower my grades. And of course, her agenda worked, I tried harder, and I got my A. The Lord wants us to do better and to live up to our God-given potential. 
and to be a testimony of his presence in our lives. And there can be no testimony without a test. The scripture reads that with his restored voice, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, broke out in prophetic psalm. And the Holy Spirit seeks to mightily operate in our lives. Be open to the possibility that our current problems may be a discipline from the Lord. And let us not wait until the new year and make a resolution. Don't put off tomorrow what we need to do today, seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Third, the Song of Zechariah is called the Benedictus from its opening words in Latin, blessed be the Lord, stresses the relationship God has with the chosen people, a covenant to be honored in perpetuity. The Benedictus is saturated with Old Testament passages indicative of a priest schooled in the scriptures. Israel was God's pilot project, the launch pad to disseminate ethical monotheism in the ancient world. And through the centuries of potentates and prophets, this mission encountered repeated advances and retreats. And from our Christian perspective, the definitive action of God was to come to us as one of us in Jesus Christ. Some of us may recall the British honey man, Benny Hill. He quipped, roses are reddish and violets are bluish. If it wasn't for Christmas, we would all be Jewish. Hill was optimistic. We would not be Jewish, we would be heathens. Recently, a Jewish woman in our chapel questioned the use of the Star of David on our pyramids. And our self-understanding is that Christianity is a continuum of Judaism and that there are numerous carryovers enriching our faith, worship, and custom. The promise God made with Abraham was that his descendants would be blessed to be a blessing to the entire world. And I have on previous occasions shared that our contemporary Christmas is indebted to the contributions made by Jewish people. White Christmas, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Holly Jolly Christmas, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire, Walking in a Winter Wonderland, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Silver Bell, Sleigh Ride, Santa Baby, Do You Hear What I Hear? And Oh Holy Night, Have Jewish Composers. During Operation Desert Storm, when the American military station in Saudi Arabia, its government announced the observance of Christmas was forbidden. This congregation was supporting men in uniform in the oil-rich kingdom. And to get around the prohibition, I announced that we were mailing them one nativity figurine at a time so as not to bring attention to what it is that we were doing. And guess what? A member of the Jewish war veterans in attendance hearing the sermon offered to help with this project. For several years, a Jewish mother and her three daughters volunteered to staff our nursery on Christmas Eve in order that the nursery supervisor could be off to be with her family. The closest the non-Christian world gets to Christianity is at Christmas. And although they may not be able to affirm our doctrine of the Incarnation, they find features of our holiday very appealing. Peace, brotherhood, charity, joy, and hope, which they can embrace. And for some non-Christians, they are more open to hear the gospel and view with high esteem Jesus of Nazareth. Commonly, we speak of the Judeo-Christian heritage in our country, and the two world religions, although differing on key issues, do share a bedrock of spiritual and moral values. The greatest gift 
Judaism has bequeathed to Christianity is the Old Testament. The 39 books from Genesis to Malachi and by his Holy Spirit inspired prophetic song with its references to the sacred scriptures, Zechariah teaches us that the God of the ages is a promise keeper and he will do good for his people in all times and in all places and he is doing so as I speak. Four, consider the reason for your existence is that you are an extra on stage in the drama of the ages, one of the supportive cast for those later who will have the lead in title roles. In his old age, Zechariah made the discovery that his primary function in life was to join wife Elizabeth and nurture their son John to be a soul winner, giving knowledge of salvation unto the nation for the remission of sins. Verse 77. Zach and Liz would never live to see it, but the son they invested their lives would be mightily used by God to inaugurate a great movement preparing hearts, minds, and souls to welcome Jesus the Messiah. Edward Kimball was a shoe salesman who introduced a team to White L. Moody the Christ. Moody Avenue in Newcastle is named for him. Evangelist Dwight L. Moody preached with J. Wilbur Chapman coming to faith at a rally. Pittsburgh pirate Billy Sunday was converted under the ministry of J. Wilbur Chapman. Billy Sunday went on to become a preacher man and at a meeting impacted Mordecai Ham. At a tent revival in Charlotte, North Carolina, an adolescent, Billy Graham, received Christ as Savior and Lord under Mordecai Ham. At the Crusades of Billy Graham, millions and millions of men, women, and youth on every continent made decisions for Christ. Human existence is not just about me or in the present. Each one of us can exert a positive influence setting in motion a later development by God. The hard-working father and the dedicated mother making sacrifices for their children are forming a stable foundation for their son and daughter to be emotionally healthy, mentally sharp, physically well, and spiritually keen. So when they are adults, they will be able to find their place in the world. Are we making society better or worse by our being here? And are we preparing the way for the Lord for those who will follow us? John Henry Newman was a respected intellect in the 19th century, and he used his mind to advance the faith. Newman centers found on many college campuses were named for him. Newman made the evaluation. God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed work to me, which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. Back in the 1980s, there was a song by the Gaithers, Church World Heard and Reheard, and it has gone into retirement and it needs to reappear. This stemmed the tide of pervasive pessimism invading the culture. I am a promise. I am a possibility with a capital P. I am a great bundle of potentiality. And I am learning to hear God's voice and I'm trying to make the right choice because I am a promise to be everything God wants me to be. Family of God, if life is a contract between the living, the dead and the unborn, let us commit ourselves to the values and can pass them on, which have withstood the test of time and give them to those who will come after us. 
last and five. John the Baptist is a transitional character in sacred history, the last of the Old Testament prophets. John the Baptist had an international outreach in his day, and the entire thrust of his ministry pointed to Jesus Christ. This is the coat of arms of the territory of Puerto Rico. It was created by the monarchy of Spain and has been used for over 500 years. Founded by Columbus in 1508, the island was christened San Juan Batista. Note on the shield the sentence spoken by Zechariah, John is his name. The capital was established Puerto Rico, meaning rich port. Later, Governor Ponce de Leon switched the names, calling the island Puerto Rico and the capital San Juan. I bring to your attention a lamb is seated on a closed Bible. When watching Jesus walking toward him, John made the proclamation, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John pointed to Christ, and perhaps even before he initiated his mission in the outback, John acquired this Christic center from his parents, scrutinized the Benedictus, and there are allusions to the coming Messiah. The horn of salvation means Christ. Horn is not a musical instrument, but the protrusion of a bull, a ram, or an ox, symbolizing power and protection found in Christ. Much of the language in this song is talking about Jesus, not John. Christ is the day spring from on high, giving light in the darkness, guiding our feet into the way of peace. The midweek Bible study is examining the nativity and for the first class in the series, I passed out to all the participants these hologram eyeglasses. And if you had been in attendance, you would have received one. And what does it do? If you wear the glasses and look at miniature clear Christmas tree lights, the name Jesus Christ shows up. And the lesson I was driving home Jesus Christ is to be found on every page of the Jewish Bible. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen wrote, The Old Testament is likened to a radio and the New Testament to a television. The Old Testament supplies us with the voice of God the New Testament gives us the picture. Jesus is not only the reason for the season, he is the reason for the Bible, and he is our reason to live. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Yes.